Hello, everybody. So welcome to the uh, Enfold uh, seminar. Uh, Enfold is a network for life detection, which is one of several research coordination networks of the NASA Astronauty Program. We're excited to have you here. Uh, we have this seminar every other month. Uh, we would have it more often if we had more speakers. So if you're interested in presenting uh, your science or your technology or the merger between the two, as we'll hear today, uh, please, please, please reach out to us either on the Enfold Slack or at contact.enfold.gmail.com. Today, we're very excited and very grateful for Morgan Cable and Caitlin Carpenter to talk to us about a really exciting uh, concept uh, out of JPL. Uh, it's called EELS, it's a mission for Enceladus. And uh, the floor is yours, Morgan and Caitlin. Thank you again so much for joining us today. Thanks so much for having us. Uh, so I'm going to start, and uh, then Kaylin and I will be tag teaming this presentation. Uh, so feel free to ask us questions. Uh, we're going to go for about 45 minutes ish, and then uh, we will have plenty of time for questions. So just a quick check. You guys can all see this all right. Everything looks yep. good. Looks Sweet. Great. Okay. So. Uh, hi, everyone. Thanks so much for the invitation to speak today. Uh, I am the science lead of this uh, mission concept that's under development, and Kaylin uh, is the PI. Kaylin, do you just want to say a quick hello? Hello, Kaylin Carpenter. Mor Morgan and I have been uh, dreaming of getting down these vents since Cassini was flying through them, and today we want to present the leading way we think we can do this. Absolutely. Super stoked to be part of this team. So this is a concept that is under development with some uh, internal funding uh, at JPL. We're really happy to get your feedback. We've just kicked off what we call the project phase, which is uh, three years of work. And so we're at a, a great point. If you have suggestions, inputs, questions, we can be adaptive uh, to sort of the needs of the community when it comes to the search for life at this fascinating world. So uh, without further ado, Kaylin already mentioned the amazing discoveries of Cassini. Uh, I was fortunate enough to be involved in that mission in the last few years, and uh, it was just an incredible, uh, you know, changing our, our perceptions of the Saturn system, its rings, and its moons. And one of the key discoveries that Cassini made uh, was about this, what originally we thought was a tiny ice ball, you know, about the size of the state of Arizona, uh, called Enceladus. And this is a moon that's embedded within the diffuse E-ring of Saturn. And now we actually know that it's intrinsically tied to that E-ring in terms of generating the material uh, that comprises it. And uh, thanks to Cassini, we now know that this moon, among uh, others, is very dynamic and exciting and a potentially a target for astrobiology investigations. Just a, a quick fact sheet on Enceladus. It's about 14% the size of Earth's moon. That means that its gravity is substantially less. It's about 1% of Earth's gravity. It's got a pretty rapid orbital period around Saturn, uh, which is useful in terms of trying to do uh, seismology or geophysical investigations. You don't actually need a lot of quiescent time on the surface to be able to get that full orbital period. Uh, but do keep in mind that Saturn's year is almost, <clears throat> excuse me, is almost uh, 30 Earth years long. Um, so as, as Enceladus and Saturn are, are going around the sun, we will get different exposure of uh, various parts of Enceladus's surface um, to sunlight uh, over that period. The ice shell thickness of Enceladus, we'll get into in a little bit more detail here, is variable. It's thicker at the North Pole, thinner at the South Pole. So the thickness you're seeing here is specifically South Pole focused. Uh, and it has a global subsurface liquid water ocean uh, that's uh, around 30 kilometers deep uh, based off of Cassini measurements. This is one of my favorite images of the plume that's uh, uh, backlit by the rings as well as um, uh, some Saturn shine. Enceladus certainly is unique uh, in that this is one of the, the few places in the solar system where we know we have active uh, geysering activity, and it's the only place so far where we know that that plume is directly sourced from the subsurface ocean, or at least we have very, very strong evidence uh, in that regard. Uh, so this 
obviously gives us a unique opportunity to sample directly, uh, as directly as you can, that ocean without the need to dig or drill, uh, which means in terms of capability for robotic explorers, this is a key target to explore in this decade and following. And just one thing to point out that while Cassini is credited with the discovery of the plume, uh, this is an image from uh, one of the Voyager spacecraft as it uh, did its fly through of the Saturnian system. And so you can see Saturn here in the bottom and Enceladus as a, a tiny little orb up at the top and Ted Strick with some modern processing, uh, digital processing of this image was able to uh, generate something that does have what looks like a, a bit of the signature of the plume coming out of the South Pole. Now, it, of course, this Cassini is still credited with the discovery of the plume, but this tells us that we have definitive evidence, not just the presence of the E-ring itself, uh, but even photographic evidence that the plume has been active uh, for, for a pretty long while. And based off of our current understanding of Enceladus and modeling, we believe the plume has been active for much, much longer than that. Uh, the plume is coming out of these four tiger stripes, these large cracks, fissures in the south polar region, or the south polar terrain, as it's called, of Enceladus. Uh, these are all named uh, after, uh, all the features, in fact, on Enceladus are named after things from the tale of Thousand Arabian Nights. So the tiger stripes have names like Baghdad, um, and, and uh, it's pretty exciting. Baghdad, Damascus, Cairo, and Alexandria. And they're not in order from A, B, C, D, E either. They're, um, the, the labels swap around a bit. Uh, but each of these has uh, been demonstrated to have activity and material coming from it, both in the form of gas and grains. Uh, what you're looking at here are some uh, images from the imaging, the science subsystem of Cassini, as well as uh, SEERS, the infrared, to show that these are indeed hot spots. So they're much warmer uh, than the rest of the surface of Enceladus, which is around around um, 80 Kelvin. Uh, it can be as high as 200 Kelvin, we believe, right at uh, where that material is emanating out of the vents. Uh, thanks to uh, some processing by Paul Shank and others, we have uh, digital elevation models. Um, some through photoclinometry, uh, where you only need one image to be able to generate uh, those DEMs that tell us uh, a bit more. These are exaggerated in the vertical scale. Um, Enceladus doesn't actually have you know, anything close to Mount Everest or, or things of that size. The highest surface features are on the order of low hundreds of meters. So you know, two, 300 meters-ish. Uh, when we get up to uh, the trough that, that uh, so we sort of have um, ridges that come up and then the trough that goes down. Uh, we're looking at a depth of that trough of about 250 meters. Of course, that seems to extend below where the uh, surface of, of Enceladus is. And uh, I'll show you an image in a little bit of the two potential models of uh, how deeply that might close in uh, as you go down uh, trying to reach liquid uh, in that subsurface liquid water ocean. So what else do we know from Cassini? Well, uh, Cassini had two mass spectrometers on board, and these were able to sample the plume material uh, during multiple fly-throughs where the Cassini spacecraft actually went through the plume. Uh, one of those, the ion and neutral mass spectrometer, INMS, uh, told us about the plume gas. Uh, this instrument was able to detect primarily water vapor, uh, but some other things that were pretty interesting for us, including uh, methane, ammonia, and molecular hydrogen. Uh, that measurement was a bit challenging to make uh, because when water gets into uh, the instrument, it can interact with the walls of the, the chamber and potentially generate hydrogen that way too. And so the authors, uh, Chris Glein, Hunter Wade, and others did a really fantastic job of uh, backing out and proving that that hydrogen was originally part of the plume uh, material, the, the gas phase, and wasn't uh, completely generated from any reactions post sampling. Now this is exciting for uh, potential habitability because methane and H2 both are uh, either utilized by or generated by uh, different forms of life. For example, methanogens or methanotrophs, uh, which either generate or utilize methane. And uh, Chris Klein did a calculation. I'm forgetting exactly what it was. He equated the um, amount of uh, molecular hydrogen coming out of Enceladus in terms of a unit of large pizzas. 
uh, for just the caloric content. And I think it was something like 300 large pizzas an hour or something like that. Someone fact check me uh, on that. A quick Google search should be able to find that. But there, there is a lot of energy available for chemo, uh, chemo autotrophic organisms uh, just based off of the vapor phase itself. Uh, so it looks like we have at least two ingredients right now for life as we know it, right? Uh, we need water and you need energy. And so we seem to have these two sources. Well, what about chemical building blocks? This is where the plume grains come in. Uh, so the cosmic dust analyzer, a CDA, is a time of flight mass spectrometer. What happens is it has a rhodium plate. And as Cassini flew through the plume of Enceladus at uh, speeds of around 7 to 17 kilometers a second, those ice grains would impact that plate and then essentially go poof, right? Uh, it, the energetics uh, associated with that impact led to impact-induced ionization, which volatilizes, so brings into the gas phase, and ionizes a lot of the molecules trapped inside. And because of that, we were able to identify not just salts and things that can tell us about the, uh, the salinity of the ocean, but also uh, large organic molecules up to sort of the mass cutoff of the instrument. Now, this is a, a time of flight mass spectrometer, and that means that it measures how long these ions take to move along a tube. And so as you go to longer flight times, your mass resolution gets uh, gets uh, less less good. And so uh, for a lot of these high molecular weight species, CDA did not have the mass resolution to say, for instance, if that was a protein or a polypeptide or, or you know, some other really interesting organic molecule. So a follow on mission will have to make those assessments. But the point is that there are these large organic molecules. And so that fulfills that third criterion for habitability, uh, having organic building blocks uh, that cell or that putative life could use to build the molecular machinery. Uh, for life as we know it, um, cells, cell membranes, proteins, uh, what have you. And so this is our current picture of Enceladus. We've got this ice crust uh, that's variable in thickness, but thinner at the South Pole on the order of uh, sort of one to five kilometers, uh, depending on uh, which, which model, which paper you're reading. Uh, and thanks to the plume, we have direct access to that subsurface liquid water ocean. One thing I didn't mention before is CDA also detected silica nanograins, SiO2. Uh, these are important. They were detected uh, primarily in the E-ring, and but since that comes from the plume, uh, we know they're sourced from Enceladus. Uh, grains of the particular size and oxidation states, uh, Sean Su and others were able to demonstrate could only have formed if that liquid water ocean is in contact with a rocky core at temperatures of 90 degrees C or above. Uh, and so this gives us really uh, strong evidence for hydrothermal activity that's also supported by the methane and the hydrogen we see in the gas phase. So this is a very exciting, habitable, dynamic world that's worthy of further study. Uh, so with that water rock interaction, we can now invoke our understanding of hydrothermal systems that are similar here on Earth at our seafloor. This is a, an image of Lost City at the Mid-Atlantic Ridge uh, down in the bottom of the Atlantic Ocean. Uh, these are places that have similar pH uh, ranges as well as uh, temperatures for uh, hydrothermal interaction of our rocky seafloor, the interior, uh, with the cold ocean water. And so by studying these systems, we may be able to inform potential um, measurement requirements, things that we might search for and limits of detection of various organisms. So, well, how can we potentially get into or access these ends? Of course, you can do a lot of science uh, through fly, fly by, fly through, or land admissions, uh, but we at JPL like to dare mighty things, and so we wanted to think of what that next step would be, and we actually don't think it's that far off, at least in terms of the technology development that Kaylin will be talking about in a little bit. So if you did want to design something to get down into these vents, what would be your primary driver? And uh, based off of our current understanding of the, the plume and its uh, variability from those Cassini fly-throughs, there are two models that fit the data that we have. One is uh, sort of this, this open uh, venting model. Uh, Kite and Rubin are, and I can include the reference in the chat, are uh, the major proponents of this, where essentially you just have this opening that's about five meters 
uh, wide that goes straight from the vacuum of space down to the ocean. And in this, this model, you have obviously at that interface uh, where you have liquid uh, directly connected to the vacuum of space, you've got boiling um, and turbulent circulation that's associated with that due to dissipative heating. Uh, and you also will have tidal pumping. And so you could envision that five meter wide chasm uh, of sort of op opening and, and closing partially, not completely, uh, but uh, you could imagine then that that liquid layer could pump up and down along the uh, thickness of the ice crust. Uh, this is actually a relatively easy solution for anything that did want to access those vents. You just need to stay less than five meters wide and you could get down there, right? So, so that's uh, not a stressing case for us as much as the cryovolcanic model. Uh, this one, uh, Carl Mitchell and others have been working on. And here, this is more akin to some of the uh, volcanic interrupt. Er, uh, volcanic eruptions we have here on Earth, where you have a choke point. And underneath that, you have some sort of bulge or chamber uh, where you have sort of subsonic flow. But then after that choke point, now you have supersonic flow. And that opening could be relatively small on the order of 10 centimeters, tens of centimeters. Uh, but it's it's maintained open by this immense pressure of this uh, on the order of 200 kilograms per second across all four tiger stripes of gas and grains that, that is spewing out of that liquid water ocean. And so this is the case that uh, in terms of the engineering challenges, we are designing eels too. Um, and at that point, I think I'm gonna let uh, Kalen take over. So he'll start with the critical parameters and then get into some really exciting uh, demonstrations of uh, what we are currently doing and what we have planned for the next three years. So take it away, Kalen. Thank you, Morgan. Well, I'm I'm inspired again. I'm always inspired by Morgan. This is just fantastic. So I just was blown away by these images. As Kevin Hand said, Enceladus is way more interesting than it has any right to be. And the more we just delve into it, the more and more interesting it becomes. So as I was reading papers uh, as an engineer. What I was interested in was not exactly what is there, but knowing there's a debate. And these debates set up the perfect hypothesis to you know, create the experiment that is a mission. The mission's going to go and hopefully put to rest these debates and spark others, put some fuel on the fire. So in reading all of the papers, we know there's the 250 kilograms a second. This is one thing we all agree on. Anything from Cassini that's directly an output is great because we know one half of the equation. So we know the exit velocity, number of vents. There's a lot of things we know, and there's a bunch more that then we can infer. So depending on the, the um, initial conditions, your assumptions for the initial conditions, everything else has to change, right? So if you have these big, open, slow boiling vents, you're likely not going to get very much coming up other than some small particles. So a fly through isn't going to be able to really understand the ocean. If it is a cryovolcanic case, well, there's a huge range. Is this something that's being driven by exhalation of the volatile? So basically shaking up a soda bottle and spraying it out. If it's being driven by um, your H2, your methane, CO2 uh, coming out of solution, it could be carrying liquid water up. Then it could go all the way to where just the weight of the ice is essentially helping to spray a jet of water, which we don't really think is happening. But as an engineer, I've got to take the full spectrum into account. So what do we want to do? We want to actually go see that water. We're not really looking for a smoking gun. We want to see the water. We want to see if anything's swimming in it. So if we can land on the south pole of Enceladus, on one of the peaks of probably Damascus sulcus, because that's the one that seems to have, um, it's either the warmest because the thinnest ice, or it may just have the most material coming out, meaning the largest openings, came up with the Exobiology Extant Life Surveyor Eels robot. So this is fluidizable media in the low gravity, the 100th Earth gravity. So we'll likely need to anchor ourselves once we get down to the vent to be able to not only assess the vent, but sample from the vent and actually get our first taste directly from an alien ocean. Now, at this point, if we have liquid water, we can run it through something like the digital holographic microscope, or if it's just volatiles, we can sniff it. Either way, we will assess and we want to go deeper. So if it's open crevasse, we could actually just repel down. 
if gravity doesn't dominate, it means that the sidewalls are going to be heated and pressurized by the flow, so it will be above the triple point and ice like we know it. So these become these self-driven ice skates, essentially. It's a self-driven corkscrew that adapts to whatever it feels. So it's both feeling the vent flow coming up, so we can actually follow that as our guide map to the liquid water that's driving it, but we can feel the sidewalls. So just like you probably climbed your hallway as a kid, you can push harder on the walls and induce more force than gravity is, or in this case, the gravity or the plume flow is putting on the robot. So this is actually a separate model. So if it's the open crevasse, we have that spiral shape. If we have to go down through one of these cryovolcanic models, we can become a self-driven screw. This has less mechanical disadvantage, but also has to react much higher forces. And at this point, we're able to get down through that, you know, 10, 10 to centimeter throat to be able to get down to the um, high tide point, which is going to be within a kilometer of the surface, maybe as much as tens of meters, get down into the ocean. Once we get into the ocean, and we can start really understanding what this alien environment is like. And what's really cool about Enceladus is because it's overpressurized, we're not looking at something that is very complex and chaotic. We're looking at something where we're specifically looking to see if hydrothermal vents, the leading hypothesis for where life would have begun on Earth, is where it begins. And if not, what does a prebiotic ocean look like? What types of complex chemistry could exist that would also lead up to life, but we don't have a record of here anymore. So we have um, in, in this concept that we did a study of, we actually landed during the polar night where it's faced to the, the rings of Saturn. The reason why we can see them so well through our telescope is they'll face towards us, but they'll flip over, face the other direction. So if we were to launch around the 2031 time frame, we would land in polar night. So you can see we've got an orbiter. Uh, we'd love if we can have multiple robots because having um, multiple chances is great, plus we can do parallel science. In this one, there's actually a melt probe as well. So hey, um, if, if you could go with everything, why not? If not, we would love to go even with a single eels robot, which as it goes away from the lander can go through the concentric rings of where heavier molecules may have fallen out of the flow away from where we've contaminated the surface, probably spend years actually assessing the surface sampling, uh, really understanding the environment until it gets down to the crevasse to get its fir first taste and sniff while well, we've had a sniff of the alien ocean. So let, let's talk about what we're doing here on Earth. So how do we take this and we close the imagination gap, right? This isn't an animation. This isn't Pixar. The, this, this, this is NASA. This is JPL. We're, we're building this thing. So uh, we start looking at it. And the forces, to give you an idea, um, I've been living at Yosemite for a good portion of lockdown. And they shut down the lifts when the wind gets to 70 miles an hour. So 70 miles an hour tends to be a windstorm. And so getting smacked in the face with um, ice particles at 70 miles an hour is not fun, but it's really not that bad. And that's one of the higher ends these forces can be. And th this isn't even at a point where it causes a real safety issue for a commercial entity, right? So if you start thinking about that, the real reason why these things are reaching escape velocity is because there's essentially no gravity. It's 100th gravity, there's not a lot there. Well, how do you gravity offload on Earth to 100th gravity? And how do you then have loads that are gonna react like a supersonic force um, uh, on the robot with, with your kind of pressure resistance? Well, we can go up against gravity. If we have a 80 kilogram robot and we're going up, we have to be able to support 80 kilograms of reaction force. And you know that, that's gonna be offsetting gravity. So on Enceladus, we did some calculations to figure out what it would be in one of the worst case uh, proposed scenarios at a 10 centimeter throat. And we get essentially 585 Newtons, which is about 60 kilograms. So we are proposing that going up against gravity here on Earth is actually a very good um, example of going down these vents on Enceladus. So we are building robots to go up and down through crevasses and moulons um, in the cryosphere on Earth. So the way we've designed it, it has this active skin and then it has these shape actuators. 
And so we have the tether management in the back. So we feed out the tether from the robot. So we don't have to worry about getting snagged or getting dragged. Um, to be able to have five kilometers of tether, we would have to have about 1.7 meters of these modules on the back end. Uh, what we're looking at right there is about 0.8. So that's about half. We'd need two more. Um, then the rest of them moving up, this robot for reference is right now about 15 centimeter diameter and it's four meters long. So we have the ability to describe the circumference of a one meter diameter um, crevasse or moulin. And then in the head, we have the ability to see, we have the ability to taste, we can put a digital holographic microscope in it, we can put our different payloads, whether it's C, LIF, what, whatever the science community tells us they would like to do, we are looking to accommodate and actually do demonstrations here on Earth. Let's go to uh, the next slide. So some of the cool things we've done is we've built this and actually right behind me is the full four meter one that we're working on. It's not quite together, but I heard someone pounding in the background. So we have more and more of them coming together pretty quickly. But we did during COVID, this was done in an intern's room, Airbnb room. So we were still able to put this together and demonstrate that we actually can do linear mobility. We always thought there would be a little bit of yawing. We've been able to do some of the shapes um, so we can do figure eights. And one of the conversations I was having today with the um, surface mobility lead is how we can get up unconsolidated media and some really unique things that a robot of this form factor is able to do. So once we were able to do what we call the ground mobility portion that you see here, we moved into looking at the vertical mobility. Oh, there, there's one more. So we were talking about how the robot feels, right? So we want to be able to see, but especially when we're in the vent, we're not positive we can. And you'll see a little bit more of that soon. So what we did is we showed that we could feel the world around us and we can control this robot to adapt its shape depending on what it feels, and then also to exert a given force on the world around it. And by exerting that force, it's kind of like our ability to grip, but this one is in reverse, so it's outward. And we're actually looking at the reaction forces. So here's the robot going up a simulated vent, um, big, big trash can with some foam in it being, COVID, um, where we're building actually the test bed now and setting up to be able to show you the uh, full-size robot in ice. But the nice thing about being able to do this is we were able to demonstrate that we could do it fairly simply, able to do the software, able to show that not only does physics say we can do this, but we were able to do this. This is the EELS robot, the Exobiology Extant Life Surveyor. And so this time we added a bump into it. And so the bump just shows that we're able to have the whole system change the force and the force profile to be able to maintain essentially that outward grip. So you can actually see it here in some of the simulation we did. Do you see how there's those cones going inward? Those cones actually have to meet as if they were gripping, but we do it with the reaction force. So the robot has to have a good enough understanding of how it's pushing and which direction those reaction forces are going. So you can see here, we tested some of our algorithms. We have what we think we're doing. Then we've got sensors on the outside telling us what we are. And you can see all of those forces meeting in the middle. And we're trying to do this adaptive force control to make sure one of them doesn't push harder than the other and offset anything so that we can always maintain that control as the robot does this. So um, let's see in the next part right here. Oh, that's that, that's all of it for this portion. So now some of the unique things about this robot is to be able to pack in as much um, torque as a truck in something that is, you know, about six inch diameter. We went to some of the top of the line drone motors, but instead of having these designed for speed, we've had them designed more for the low end torque, but these are very transparent hollow motors. And the other really interesting thing here is we created a first of its kind counter rotating gearbox. Um, so with a single input, we're getting our gear reduction. We're also getting the counter rotation and we're able to have those two coupled together. So when we get to the kinematics, you can see on the left, there's a lot of different ways that this could be done. You've probably seen um, like the heavy snake robot. It has a different form. The reason why we went to this kind of elbow with the rotation joint is if you put your fingers together and you've got that one pivot, 
if you pivot that one, um, that one place, you get this projected um, diameter that essentially shrinks. So you see on the far left and the one the far right, the elbow is held at 20 degrees and all we're doing is rotating those elbows. What that does is it gives us this very elegant circle where that circle can of course conform to whatever it runs into, but ensures that we're always going to have our gripping screws on the outside. The other cool thing about that is this becomes a cam. So if we want to press harder into the world around us, we don't just have to, you know, bend an elbow and have mechanical disadvantage. That rotation with only the, um, you know, the 15 centimeter diameter, now all of those rotating together can ensure we have more than three locations in contact and that we can get greater forces onto the sidewalls. Actually, you can see how tightly packed this thing is. So there, there's a bunch of interesting challenges here that we don't have in a lot of other things. One of them is rate of traverse. So M2020 Perseverance um, has to go 15 kilometers in 1.25 or two and a half Earth years. We want to go three kilometers in 16 hours. Why do we want to do that? Because there is a periodicity to these events. So there is within every 16 earth hours, there's a change in the flow rate, there may be a change in the geometry, there is, there is changes and people say those changes may be insurmountable. So we want to make sure that we can actually cover that range within the period where we can essentially time it to be able to get through the gap when it's either widest or it has the least amount of mass flux or what have you. So this is one of the things we want to be able to assess. The other problem we were talking about is you're not necessarily able to see very far. This is why the robot has this proprioceptive or tactile feeling ability. This is someone sending an endoscope down uh, Old Faithful. So you can see, we're definitely going to have the ability to have remote vision, but it is not easy to see when you have water flowing against you, you have bubbles, you have mixed phase, you might have ice, and you've got the light actually shining off the sidewalls and maybe overpowering your camera, what have you. So we're working on ways that we can actually solve this. So if you go to the next slide, um, let's see. This, this robot, normally we design them to be very deliberative, right? The robot or the spacecraft, if anything goes wrong, it just stops and waits for a person to tell it what to do. We don't get that chance. This is a dynamic environment with over a three hour time flight around trip delay. So the whole robot needs to be reactive, know what it needs to do by itself. So there's strong autonomy drivers here. Um, normally we have something really robust, six wheels, right? Six wheels, you really only need three to make a plane. So we need something that's really adaptive, right? So if something goes down, if something breaks, whatever happens, this robot needs to carry on. It needs to be able to, even if it's limping, limp along to its conclusion. And then finally, normally we design something that's very productive protective. In this case, we're designing something that's very, very resilient, right? So this is something where um, some people say, oh, that is so many actuators that's over constrained. It's not really because essentially it's in contact from its frame of reference with the plane. It doesn't see it in its controls actually as a constrained environment, right? Essentially it's something long, each of those long things are in contact. If that were flat against gravity or if it's pushing, that's its interactions, right? So you don't have the same over constraining that you, you would normally think of as, you know, pins and holes. Um, so we have this robot that is very resilient. It's very adaptable. The other thing it has that's kind of first of its kind is this ability to sense where it's going by things that are coming into contact with it, right? Normally we send out light, we get the light back or we get reflected light. In this case, we have supersonic flow. That supersonic flow is coming from its source and we can follow that source. Um, basically you can follow the flow to that source. So if there's an obstacle, um, it will block it. If we get to a point where there's multiple directions or branching paths, we can feel where the streamline's strongest and we can follow that. Excellent. So you can see some of our collaborators at CMU, they've been doing some really good work with this proprioceptive um, robots where you give it a heading and by the shape of the robot, 
it starts with a given gate to go that way, but it feels when it comes into contact with something. And then it will just keep essentially muddling forward, but trying to course correct, even though it doesn't have the ability to have what we would call a global position knowledge. So you can see um, doing it with raised things in sand, unconsolidated media, in rocks, and all of these different locations. One great thing at the top right, you see the robot, um, you see the robot that is sidewinding. This is one of the best ways to get up slopes, especially of unconsolidated media that we see in the animal world. That shape that's leaving behind those marks, if you look at them, they're actually the same marks that are left behind by counter-rotating screws. So it is actually a bio-inspired methodology we're using, but instead of having to do these full body shifts, what we're looking at is using Revolut, so more efficient motors, to be able to just continuously drive this robot, both in unconsolidated media, consolidated media as grippers in the ice for the vertical mobility, but also as propellers underwater. Excellent. Next slide. So we were talking about vision through software. We can actually uh, get a lot of those occlusions out. You can see the difference where you see the snow on the left, not so much on the right. So there's a bunch of things we're working on in software. We're actually bringing a bunch of these sensors up to Mount St. Helens to see what the robot sees, see what a science instrument wants to see, try to correlate the two so we can start having the robot recognize science uh, locations for sampling, but also so that we can start understanding which robot or science sensor sees the wall instead of into the wall of ice. Turns out many of our wavelengths of light will go down as much as four centimeters, which is quite quite a bump if you're not expecting it. So there's some very interesting technical challenges in this. And then in the next slide, this is our concept of operations. This is actually on the back end, the same software that we use for um, operating the helicopter and the rovers on Mars. So we just want people to get a sense of what the robot would do. In the upper right, you see what that sensor head is doing. If we had a six axis uh, pitot tube, it's sensing where the streamline is. Every once in a while, you'll see on the left, it's gonna stop and it actually will move the head back and forth, sweeping the head to help with the maps that's making, but also to understand where the streamline is. Cause you don't wanna be right in the middle of it, but you wanna know where it is and what the, uh, um, magnitude is so we know how hard to push on the sidewalls. Then you can actually see where it's straight. The contact point should be lighting up so the robot is aware of where it's contacting, how hard it's contacting. And then at the uh, bottom right, you see the poses. So we are not assuming that there is only one gate that's the most efficient or best. For the time being, we're treating this as a three-dimensional line with this active skin that essentially will traverse what it sees as planes. That being said, needless to say, running only four actuators is more efficient than running 20 actuators. So we are working on different poses where the robot will assess its environment and know to change. Now, getting back to that unconsolidated media, that fluidized media. So this is at 3% gravity and you see unconsolidated media is similar to your champagne powder um, snow. You can see how the whole robot flips backward because of the center of gravity and because everything's fluidizing around it. So one of the nice things about us moving to this inline uh, gate is in the next slide, you can see we don't have that pitchback moment that's causing the robot to flip backwards. Another question we had is, well, what if we do sink down in? Is that a problem? And we're finding it looks like this robot will be able to burrow. And a burrowing robot opens up some really interesting capabilities for trying to get up these unconsolidated slopes. So even though we believe it's all downhill from the lander, we are looking at if we did have an uphill portion, what will we have to do? Then that um, yeah, on the right, you can actually see that's in a vacuum. You can see that sheaf around, these are anchors, right? The anchor on the back of the robot. This is what it was modeled off of. This is some early work they did, but you see that sheaf reconsolidating around the um, heated probe. On the left, you can see it's sublimation of dry ice. So both of them are similar. So we're working on anchoring, but also sampling technologies based off of some of this. 
But that redeposition that you're seeing, making that sheaf on the right, is one of the reasons why we are looking at what the sidewalls could look like, but definitely the evolved case. Now, we did just, or uh, we're making right now, some tiny little converging diverging nozzles because that sheaf you see is getting made is at subsonic speeds. It could be that all of that is not able to form at supersonic speeds. So we're uh, building a better vent in a chamber to be able to understand. All right, on to the next slide. So this is the Earth robot that we're building to show a Enceladus capability. Excellent. Awesome. Thanks so much, Kaylin. I, I always get super excited when you talk about the engineering as much as you get excited when I talk about the science. So we all know Enceladus is amazing. It's not the only place to go and search for life, but it certainly gives unique access uh, that makes it a priority. And this is just a taste of one of the ways that we might potentially uh, get into those vents and sample that ocean. Uh, so we're really happy to uh, answer any questions you might have. And we'd love any feedback or suggestions as we continue to develop this over the next three years. We'll just leave that there for the Q&A. <laughs> Thank you so much, Morgan and Kaylin. Wow, it's probably one of the most exciting concepts I've seen in a long time. So the floor is completely open to questions. Uh, if anybody have uh, any questions, please feel free to ask. I'm going to look down the chat as well. I, I oh, love yeah, the I idea of measuring it in pizzas. That is a great idea. Helen, could you say something a little bit about how do you make this waterproof and how you prevent the gears from coming up from the particles that would be in the water? And how do you manage the tether? It seems like that's the, the weakest link in all this. So great, great question. Um, so a lot of people on the team are scuba divers. And to put it in perspective at the 100th gravity, you've got to go a kilometer for what would be 10 meters for us. So if the water is definitely a kilometer down, that's like, you know, 10, 10 meters. So you're talking about one, um, one like earth atmosphere of pressure. So one earth atmosphere of pressure is not a whole lot of pressure for seals. So we're not overly worried about any of them failing. Any of the generic ones we have on earth actually are, are great for Europa. We definitely have issues with that. So we've been looking at some really crazy sealing and pressure vessels for Europa. And so it is because of low gravity, you don't have that issue so much. So we basically designed them um, with Teflon seals. Teflon does well with the temperature changes. Uh, we're not gonna be cold when they really need to be used because it'll be liquid water. So it's well within the range of what the robot's gonna need. And we're hoping to actually build one we can have swimming. I know some um, colleagues at UCSD are working on one right now. So uh, hopefully you'll see some swimming variants of this. Um, why, why I'm saying variant is on Enceladus at the 100th gravity, right, you've got the same mass of your water. So this thing can be super dense and we don't need much power to thrust some water back to stay at the ice water interface. But on earth, that's very hard. And to be buoyant, we would have to grow quite a bit. So the ways you can vary it is if you're not trying to do 300 Newton meters of torque, you don't need the gearboxes, you can save a lot of weight. Then at the same diameter, you can still drive everything. You also don't have the resistance. So you can make a robot that looks exactly the same, that is buoyant, um, it's just for Earth. Right, hey, I, I answer it. Yeah, Joey. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Uh, first off, great talk. That was extremely exciting, and and yeah, nothing but thumbs up. Um, one question I have is, so on Earth, the salt in the ocean is a big corroder of metal. Have you guys considered for a potential for like a salty ocean when you actually get down into the water? Yes. Yeah. So right now, everything is stainless steel and aluminum, anodized aluminum, on the outside other than the Teflon seals. So even if we wanted to spend as much as a decade um, underwater, which we do, um, we, we're basically designing it so it could handle the corrosive environment. Yeah, really good question. As an engineer, so, so another one that um, this vent that we're building 
even those really good to understand the evolution of it, you know, plane wings as you fly into a cloud, you get ice forming, right? When we stick the robot's head, if it's come off, you know, your 80 Kelvin ice, is everything going to freeze to it? Do we need to heat the robot up? Or is there a surface treatment? What do we need to do? Or is it just because it's uh, supersonic? It's not a problem. It's moving so fast that the, um, that the you know, follow on plume, Majecta is just going to take take anything off. So we're not actually going to get a layer. We're, we're not sure, but we are building a test bed to find out. And yeah, this we're going to do great. the experiment. Yeah, my, my imagination, you know, can't quite wrap around it. So you do the calculations and you're like, I'm not quite sure. I don't know. So let's build it. Let's empirically solve this. <laughs> yeah, so I'm seeing a couple of questions in the chat about payload. Uh, so right now we're, we kind of have two objectives. One is to develop, to mature this concept for a place like Enceladus, but we also want to, in doing field tests on earth, do meaningful earth science. And the payloads for these may end up being different depending on where we go and the type of science we want to do. Uh, for Enceladus, we are open to working with any and all uh, instrument development teams. Uh, we've had a couple of connections already. If you're interested in talking to us about requirements for sort of volume, uh, footprint, power, and things like that, uh, please email Kayland and myself and we can start to work with you and, and talk about details. In terms of the earth science, We've been working with uh, Alex Gardner uh, and others to look at glacial environments. Uh, there are a lot of things that are unique science that we could actually do on Earth with an architecture like this, getting to places sort of uh, accessing proglacial, and glacial, and subglacial flows uh, that potentially would be too dangerous or not readily accessible with current technologies. And so we are working with some teams to do that. Although I did see a couple of comments in the chat about suggestions of some other sort of thermal springs or, or other environments. So shoot me a message because we're just formulating right now our full plan for field uh, testing and demonstration. And if you have a particular idea in mind, uh, we'd be happy to hear that and see if that's something that we could uh, potentially incorporate over the next three years. Let's check out Guillaume's Basin. Never even heard of that. That sounds great. Uh, I'm not, not promising anything. We've got our, our cryosphere goals now, but one thing we find is once you build these robots, you, you can up do so many things. And it could be once we finish our tests, we start having other people utilize them for field tests, make them available to scientists. In fact, that's what we're doing. We're working with scientists now looking for, you know, the really valuable things you can do, um, not just the ones that map to planetary science, but also for Earth science. And actually, we've been approached by people who are looking for, um, you know, diff different archaeological sites. And you're like, that sounds cool. The robot needs to see around it to know where it's going. And that can actually give you a map of an archeological site without damaging it, getting into a place. So that's, yeah, people, people have great applications. I can't wait to see where this goes. So we haven't, that I know of thought about any of these springs um, with some overburden, but that is something that we should talk about. Let's talk about, yeah. that's a really good idea. I was thinking the same thing. So maybe we could, Graham will uh, shoot us a message if there are any sort of particular temperatures, pressures, or other things that we should be aware of. Because if if it would mean just like a minor tweak now to have a, a robot that could handle that environment too, maybe we can make those changes now so that we'll have something uh, that we could utilize in a couple of years for that. Sorry, That's Kaylin, I didn't mean to speak over you. No, no, you're, you, you have that. I should let you take all the science ones. This is an engineering question. <laughs> all right. Um, so for, for power, what we're really hoping, well, we would love if we could do onboard radioisotope, but you at the moment cannot bring radio, radioisotopes into liquid water. Uh, but our friends who do melt probes, they're pushing on that. We want to be more near term. Um, initially, Europa Lander was going to bring um, or Ocean Worlds Lander, whatever it's called now, is going to bring radioisotopes to the surface. And so there's a path forward for that. So what we would love, because we want, because of the time it takes to get there, we would love a decade or decades long mission. So if we can have right radioisotopes on the lander, and then we can do the communication, what we're looking at, uh, they have copper cladded fiber optics. So the copper for the power, the fiber optic for the communication, 
And then the ohmic losses actually, the resistive heating keeps the copper warm and it helps to limit the bend radius. We would also put a Kevlar sheaf over that so we don't have a braiding as it's moving in the vent, what have you, um, over time. And that also helps to limit the bend radius to, you know, we can do an inch um, with the fiber optics, but less than that, you start getting micro cracks, which over time could definitely end the mission. Uh, we've looked at different repeaters, but in general, we can get huge bandwidth between the lander and the robot. And we're, we're assuming we will, going off of what um, the helicopter's been able to do, have more and more processing power. So what we're looking at doing is the limitation is from the lander to Earth. And right now, as you saw, if we land in the dark, we're going to need an orbiter. And that orbiter is only going to be above us for limited periods of time. So we actually are looking at taking all of this data, huge amounts of data, and actually creating the science data product on the lander and then zipping all of that down, compressing it as much as we can and sending just that back. And then we start prioritizing the leftover raw data and transmitting that back with time. And this is actually a lot of what a decade or decades long mission would probably be is just trying to get the rich data sets back from the surface of Enceladus. Actually, the time for a lot of it, the robot will have done awesome things. The instruments will have done awesome things. Now we just need to get it back to Earth. Yeah, Sandra, there are a lot of really great questions in the chat. I'm going to make you choose <laughs> which ones we should answer next. Wow, where to start? Um, they're all so good. Um, let's see. Well, for the mobility one, the robot paying out its own uh, tether helps to make sure that it doesn't get tangled unless we were to drive back over our own tether which would be on us. <laughs> um, so there's definitely definitely some issues that we have there, but we're actually building a prototype of it. And we've got some colleagues working on a five kilometer high power tether to be able to show the efficiencies we would need to be able to do this. Um, but yeah, tether management and deployment is, is not easy. I, I have a friend though, he, uh, he's the cable guy. He, um, he puts a tether on everything. He's amazing. We're actually launching these 125 uh, meter per leg of equilateral triangle antennas out in the Arroyo here. And he's designed the spooling and unspooling. I designed the uh, launchers and we've had no issues with any, any of our launches. Everything unspools perfectly. So um, I'm, I'm more and more confident every day. But five kilometers of tether is, takes up a lot of space, right? Like how do you manage that? So is the cable stored in the eels and then it slowly pulls out? And if so, that's a lot of different modules it needs to take yeah, in. It's about 1.7 meters um, to of, of just, well, I think of them as rattlesnake, you know, rattlesnake's tail. It's empty and it just carries the rattlesnake tail. And so each of those actually pops off um, as well. So once you've fully unspooled it, so it would need two more of these, essentially. That's about half of what it would need. So it would have four of these. And when each one is empty, it would actually disengage. And we want to have those be repeaters. So if we did actually have a cut in the tether, hopefully those repeaters are still spaced far enough apart that they can um, transmit the information back. So yes, we've also cut our power, but currently we do want to have batteries in the robot. And this works as a power conditioner. It also allows us to have a surge or peak power way above what can be provided by the tether. And what's cool about that and looking at the energy density of, um, of modern cells, we could have, depending on what we needed to do, if we were in the water, um, we would only need, you know, when we're operating 20 to 40 watts, we could have months once the tether breaks. Um, we could have weeks even if we needed to run the actuators for greater mobility. So the nice thing is it doesn't necessarily mean end of mission. But yeah, I, I would say tether death is how this thing will end. <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> 
Elizabeth asking about that. sampling free. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, well, I just have a couple, I think, um, related questions. So I, I'm wondering about like, because you said that, um, like the hydrothermal vents, um, like I'm wondering if you know about the pressures down near the vents and if the uh, eels robot would be able to reach down there. And is that something that you want to do or are planning to do? Because I think that would be something really cool. Yeah, I think the pressure at the top of the ocean would be somewhere around four megapascals. And I think it gets down to 80 at the bottom, but I could be wrong. It's, it's uh, not ridiculous pressures because the gravity of Enceladus is just so much smaller. Um, and so there are actually places where we're looking at testing um, those same pressures in Earth environments. Um, and you don't have to look too hard. No. Yeah, it's... Um... What, what would it be? So that's a 40 atmosphere, 120. You can go down. We can all go down with our advanced open water diving certificate to the same pressure that is at the rock water interface. So it's about 120 meters. So if you figure out how to put five kilometers, could you put like seven kilometers together and actually glide the thing on the ocean floor? Oh my God, that would be amazing. <laughs> it would be so cool. So yes, please. I, I don't, but like I worked really hard, found people doing these like cool repeaters, ways you could try to come back um, um, using little like sonar beacons, looking at the uh, currents and found that, yeah, it looks like if we wanted to go to find the hydrothermal vents, you know, whether it's temperature or chemical gradient following. And then this robot's not great at station keeping, but it is really good for wrapping itself around a hydrothermal vent, even if there's a current. Um, so I got really excited about all that stuff. And then I was basically told, no, <laughs> too complicated, way too much, everything. So in general, I would love, love to see that. Please work it, work the technologies, prove them. If you can prove all of these technologies and help push for it, there is no limitation that says we couldn't do that. There's just perceived risk that we wouldn't be able to, so we shouldn't try. And if there's one thing I've learned from working with incredible engineers like Kalen, it's that they are capable of really amazing and surprising things and they over engineer the crap out of everything so i imagine this is going to be able to do way more than uh, what its baselines expected to do there are mighty things right exactly <laughs> we're at the, we are at the top of the hour this has been a just brilliant uh, presentation and excellent questions um morgan and kaylin thank you so much for taking the time out of your busy schedule to talk to us today really inspiring um, I'm sure your contact information is available on the interwebs, so all of you feel free to uh, reach out to them with questions. Uh, we're definitely going to follow up with ideas of where they think can go. Um, I think there's a lot of opportunities for cave exploration, personally. Please do, and we'd be folks. happy to come back if there is like an, an earth focus, you know, earth science that we could do or anything like that. We're happy to continue this discussion, so please do reach out to us. We're really looking forward to interacting more deeply with Enfold. And we'll actually have the robot. I mean, we were literally like a year behind where we want to be. I think the world is a year behind where it wants to be, except for this this virtual world, I think is 12 years ahead of where it was last year. Um, but in general, we would love to come back and show you what we've done, instruments, and when we know the science, right? Right now we're working it, but we don't, we don't have that answer yet, but we should soon. Awesome. Well, thank you again. It's been great. Have a wonderful rest of your week. You Thanks, too. everyone. Take care and have a nice Memorial Day holiday. Definitely. See you. Bye.